We are going to talk about memory and the sub-processes in memory formation, memory encoding, memory retrieval, and other factors that affect memory formation. Other than that, we are, go we are going to relate it to the past topics such as learning and consciousness because as we know, memory and learning work hand in hand. Some of the brain regions involved in learning are also involved in memory formation, proving that these two are similar processes and they help each other. Although they are not exactly the same, we know that learning would be very difficult if we don't have memory or we do not have knowledge of what we have learned in the past. Okay, so memory allows us to maintain one continuous consciousness. Okay, there are people with problems with memory, that's why they are not able to attain continuous consciousness or continuous identity. See, for example, in the case of those with dissociative personality disorder or in the case of those with who suffered from amnesia. Okay, we can see that in those cases, okay, their learning and consciousness are also affected. Okay, so let's begin our discussion. First and foremost, before something becomes a memory, we need to form memories, okay? And we define memory as the ability to take in, solidify, store, and use information. So memory is not just about storing information, it's also about how do we use the information that we have stored, okay? It's, it also stores what we have learned, okay? And we remember what we have learned before, and we use it again in future instances because in our past meeting you remember that learning is about brings about changes in behavior sometimes in our characteristics memory allows us to retrieve what we have learned before to make it useful in what we are trying to do in the present so here are the steps involved in in the formation of memories so first and foremost going back to consciousness in our consciousness there are a lot of things that we sense and perceive in the world but it is also it's the task of our brain to tell us which among these stimuli which among these changes in the environment should we pay attention to okay so in the encoding process this is the process by which the brain attends to takes in and integrates new information okay you cannot store everything that happens in your surrounding because if you remember our discussion in sensation and perception it's impossible to attend to everything that's happening around you but rather you just choose what you're going to attend to or you or you direct your consciousness in what we call selective attention now attention plays a big role when it comes to encoding memory because some of the things that we try to encode can be encoded with ease while some of them can be encoded with effort okay these two are what we call automatic and effortful processing so what are the examples of automatic processing we use this when we try to remember something that is easy to remember say for example you're trying to learn a new concept you try to relate it to something that you have already learned before so that processing can be more automatic okay while in effortful well in effortful processing with um, with the word effortful you know that we 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 engage in more effort or we try harder for us to remember these these events say for example it is your first time to do something or to learn a skill it will take more effortful processing for you to learn how to do that say for example if you're learning how to ride a bike or drive a car perhaps it's a bit difficult compared to learning it again if you had prior experience about riding a bike or driving okay so in other words, also, attention plays a role in how we encode the events. So if you're not really paying attention, then it will be harder for you to attend to these events. Therefore, it will be harder for you to encode these events. Okay? 
That's why there are things that are that must be avoided when you are trying to learn something such as multitasking because you learn from our previous discussions that in multitasking it's really impossible to engage in two tasks at the same time but rather in multitasking you are just starting different tasks and you are just rapidly switching between them hence attention is being sacrificed so does learning and memory now after encoding of memory it is now being consolidated when you are consolidating information it means that we are trying to establish stabilize and solidify a certain memory so it is less prone to decay interference and distraction and that differs a lot with encoded memory because an encoded memory it may still be prone to decay or distraction unlike in consolidated memory it is be it is characterized by better recall because it is solidified say for example drivers who are f very familiar in a certain place we can say that their memory has been consolidated because even though they're trying to do different things at the same time like for example public um, utility vehicle drivers try to get payment from the passenger while they are driving but their driving is not compromised by these possible distractions it's because their memory about that place has been consolidated so there's also a biology behind consolidation so we can say that a memory has been consolidated when there are new proteins manufactured in the brain okay this happens during long-term memory formation okay so basically this new protein strengthened the the connection between important brain regions that's why it's easier for us to recall certain memories about certain events like the layout of the place or the step-by-step -step procedure etc and later you will know more about these um, biological explanations for memory formation and also like what I've been repeatedly telling you in this course sleep plays an important role in memory consolidation like when we discuss the stages of sleep you learn that in the stage 2 or n2 of sleep our brain um, show brain waves or brain activity wherein there are sudden bursts of energy or called sleep spindles and we learn that that these slip spindles are very important in the consolidation of memory or the or the encoding of memory from short term to long term okay and that's how we can say that memory has been consolidated and remember our previous discussions it's not just about the length of sleep because you may be sleeping eight hours but you're sleeping so late you're not sleeping according to your normal circadian rhythm consolidation is more about the, the sleeping at the right time okay it's not just about the length of sleep okay so so in other words it may not be that effective if you try to review everything the night before the exam because even though you have you have learned a lot okay it may not be consolidated unlike reviewing during the day and then sleeping at the right time in the evening or at night therefore that is it for memory consolidation then eventually when memories are done in consolidation it is now ready for storage or the retention of memory over time okay so we have different ways of storing memory okay um we we employ various strategies okay particularly with children who have very short attention span we need to apply strategies that can help them recall or store okay their the information that we are sharing to them first we make use of what we call hierarchies so say for example in hierarchies we try to group together things that are similar to each other say for example utensils spoon fork knife etc 
animals, dogs, cats, lions, etc. Okay, like under four-legged animals or types of birds or the different Filipino food that we have or dishes that we have. Okay, so we try to organize them into meaningful hierarchies. Say, for example, food chain. And what are the different food chain that are in your country? And when you know the different food chain in your country, under those different food chains, you try to enumerate what are their signature dishes. Okay, and that is it for hierarchy. Organizing related pieces of information for the most specific feature they have in common to the most general. So a rule of thumb in hierarchy formation is that we put general information on the top while specific information are indicated in the bottom. Okay, Just like when you are making a hierarchy of terms when you are taking down notes. Other than that, we, it's also important for us to form healthy schema okay, or mental frameworks that develop from our experiences with particular people, objects, or events. Our schema can be unhealthy or healthy. That's why it's important for you to learn the right thing. Like what behaviorism is saying, sometimes abnormality comes from unhealthy association or unhealthy learning. So what are examples of schema? Your schema can be parents are good okay, or people are caring. Animals are not gonna bite. Here are some examples of schema. However, we can also have some unhealthy schema. Like for example, in the case of those with, with unhealthy or, or challenging lifestyle. Like they might think that the world is a cruel place to live in. Or that they have to please everyone. Or they have to be perfect in everything. Or they need to do their best all the time or else people will not accept them. So here are some negative schema that can be formed. So these schema are based on our prior experiences. So in other words, it's important for us to provide healthy and meaningful experience so that healthy schema can be formed as well. Okay. Other than schema and hierarchy formation, we also use associative network. So basically, this is similar to hierarchy, but it differs in the way that we organize the, these ideas into our mind. So these are chains of associations between related concepts. So say, for example, when you think about fire engine, okay, the color that would be closest to that would be red. Okay, when you think about a fire engine, of course, that's close to a car. But when you think about cars, a car can also be called a vehicle. A car can be a bus. Okay, a fire engine, a car can be a truck. But at the same time, a fire engine is also a fire truck. A fire engine, since it has sirens, is close to the sound of an ambulance. And the ambulance is also a car. Okay, and you see these cars in the street. Okay, so this helps a lot. When you are trying to study something, when you're trying to connect the different terms to each other, like you see some similarities between what you are trying to learn in one subject to another subject, from one lesson to another. So this is an associative network. Okay, Some students benefit from this arrangement of events in their minds. So some make use of these in their, in their research. So what they do is they, they try to think of one variable and then they try to consider what are the other constructs or variables that are similar to what I'm trying to study. Say, for example, when you say well-being, what are the different types of well-being? Psychological, subjective well-being. And when we say subjective well-being, that's close to happiness positive affect and life satisfaction okay so that is it for associative networks and then finally once you have stored the information it should also be retrieved okay when you are going to use them so this is the recovery of information stored in memory okay so some memories require conscious effort for retrieval while some are more automatic like for example your automatic thoughts okay like whenever you are humiliated 
you're thinking that everyone around you are going to say something bad about you or they're going to criticize you among that happens a lot among people with social anxiety disorder so even though others are not saying others are criticizing him constructively he or she might think that they're criticizing me because they want to embarrass me okay so some of our retrieval can be automatic some of them can be healthy some of them can be unhealthy okay well some memories require conscious effort for retrieval say for example when you are trying to take an exam and you try to recall the terms that you have reviewed or you're trying to look for cues or keywords okay most of the time it would it would help if there are some keywords in the questions so that you can recall the terms easier compared to instances where are wherein there are no keywords so let's review the memory formation once again so first you encode okay you get information then from between encoding and storage you actually have to consolidate or to transfer your memory from short term to long term and then when you store information it's about retaining it for a long period of time and then when you retrieve it it's about taking it out of storage now our retrieve information can be accurate or not accurate like in the case that i'm going to share with you later in this topic okay in social psychology there is what we call rosy retrospective wherein you are recalling an experience you say that it's all rosy and beautiful and it's colorful but in reality it is not okay some people would like to you know make their past memories look more colorful than it what it really was okay and that proves that retrieval may be inaccurate from time to time there's also what we call mandela effect okay i would like you to search more on that because i i did not include that in this lecture but when there when there's what we call mandela effect it's it's like what we call false memories okay like you are so used in the situation we're in you see the social media people posting the meme about star wars where in darth vader is saying to look that look i am your father but in reality that's not really the line that was used in the movie but why is it that people remember it as look i am your father it's because of false memories that they had about the event and there are a lot of events that are formed because of false memories. so imagine how much that will affect let's say for example court testimony or pointing out what really happened during the situation when a crime occurred think about those with let's say for example phobia or those with post-traumatic stress disorder those with post-traumatic stress disorder may suffer from nightmares about the events that psychologically traumatize them okay so that proves that in some instances our feeling or emotion during the event may influence our recall of those events okay so here are some aids in memory formation like what i told you earlier attention would be very important because not paying attention to information when first exposed exposed to it almost guarantees that it will not get encoded and processed well that's why students are being discouraged from being distracted during class hours so that they will pay attention in what they are doing okay some teachers actually believe that the more senses that you use the more that you remember the information that you're trying to take in okay other than that when it comes to memory formation the depth of processing also influence if how long are you going to retain that information okay so there are three types of processing according to the theory that we're going to talk about so that those are structural phonemic and semantic processing okay so imagine yourself imagine yourself teaching a child about words okay you're trying to enhance the vocabulary of a child in grade school 
So here are different ways that you may teach a child about the about the words that you're trying to teach him. So first, some parents or some teachers may use structural processing wherein they want the child to focus on the length of the word and look for the structure of the word like how many syllables are there okay is it a proper noun or a common noun basically is it does it start with capital or small small letter is it a long word or a short word so that's structural processing other than that okay some may use phonemic processing or trying to remind the person about something else say for example rhyming okay so perhaps trying to teach a child about words that ends with ing bringing playing studying okay so that's phonemic processing and lastly we also have what we call semantic processing wherein if you're teaching through what we call thinking about the meaning of the word so this is the deepest level of processing you're not just studying the structure of the word you're not just thinking about how does it rhyme with other words or is it similar to other words but you're actually teaching the actual meaning of the word so let's take a look at a research showing the differences in the effects of the levels of processing into memory formation okay so this this illustration on the right side of the screen hopefully it will help you understand or recall the levels of processing okay so basically what it's saying is that if we teach using structural processing there will be um low probability of recall but if we teach using semantic level there will be higher probability of recall in other words the deeper the processing the deeper the level of processing the higher the probability of recall okay so in this experiment that they have done by craig and lockhart in 1972 so they noticed that words or information okay that are studied using semantic processing are more likely to be recalled over information studied using phonemic and structural processing okay and the more that you study something then the greater the probability of that word of be for be the greater the probability of that concept to be recalled so look at the differences here the yellow boxes or the yellow bars um, show that the information was only studied once while the orange bars show are represent the conditions wherein the words or information are studied twice so if you study the information twice then you are more likely to recall it than studying the information once okay so in other words sometimes it may take more than one processing or more than one encoding consolidation and storage for you to be able to solidify the memory okay that's why in industrial training in industrial psychology it is advised that training should not be given in bulk but rather it should be distributed okay so in other words it will not be effective if you try to teach everything in one session but rather you should spread the information into multiple sessions so that it is it has a higher probability of being recalled okay so it's better to study one chapter of a book a day than studying five chapters before the exam okay and there's also what we call over learning okay when you are over learning some something you're trying to learn what you already know sometimes it can be effective but sometimes it is not effective it is not effective for professions that do the same thing every day say for example it doesn't help if a cashier will, will overlearn how he or she is going to use the cash register because even if you overlearn how to use the cash register nothing changes in the methods that you do every day what benefits from overlearning are tasks that are not performed every day say for example how to give a resuscitation or cpr to a dying person who was drowned or who is not breathing so rescuers or firefighters or anyone who performs these 
um, resuscitation intervention may actually benefit from that because if they forgot the information due to decay, then they may not be able to retrieve it during the time that they're going to use that skill. Emotion may also aid in the formation of memory. Emotional memories are easier to recall than factual memories. Okay, So sometimes it's easier for you to recall life events over the things that you are reading about in your textbook. Why? Because in emotional memory, both the amygdala, the part of the brain responsible for emotions and memory, and the hippocampus become active simultaneously. In other words, in emotional memory, both the amygdala and hippocampus are working at the same time. Hence, it is easier for you to remember, encode, um, store, and recall events that are emotional than factual. Okay? And other than that, the neurotransmitter called norepinephrine helps in learning and memory because they make synaptic connection between neurons more plastic or in other words they can make connection between synapses stronger so there are better connections okay um, due to the effects of norepinephrine in brain development okay other than that there are also individuals who may report that they experience a flash bulb memory or a detailed snapshot of memory for what they were doing during a major public emotionally charged event. Say, for example, memories of people who participated in the Boston Marathon when the Boston Bar Marathon bombing occurred. Okay, so most of the examples in flash bulb memory will include the testaments of those who were involved in the 911 incident. Okay, so like what I told you earlier in, in my example about post-traumatic stress disorder, so it also varies according to the individual, according to individual differences. Some people who have PTSD may actually forget what happened to them. That's why they cannot recall, say for example, who tried to steal from their house because during that time when they saw the, the thief in their house, they just froze and they do not know what to do. Okay, And they just forgot everything that happened that, in that event. One possible explanation to that one is Freudian concept of repression. Okay, while in some other cases, there are people with PTSD who can recall what happened exactly during the time that the event occurred. So how are things arranged? When are they? What are they doing? So that's flashbulb memory. Okay, and it may happen because of the emotional, emotional value of that event. Okay, say for example, memories about the time that a person was engaged or the memory about the time that the person was married. Okay, so the emotional value of that event helps in the storage and retrieval of those information. So what are the impediments to memory formation? So like what I told you earlier, distraction or multitasking may compromise learning and memory. So divided attention and multitasking are enemies of memory, okay? Because they interfere with the first necessary steps of memory for inf memory formation, specifically encoding. And also emotion, because even though emotion may help in memory per formation, there are instances where in emotion may not be helpful at all because we can have we, it can distort the way that we recall a certain event. So maybe if you like the person, you can recall all the positive experiences with that person. But if you dislike the person, maybe all that you will recall are negative experiences. Okay, so this is related to the rosy retrospective that I told you earlier that was that is being studied in social psychology. So the question now here is that, do we really recall memory the way that we encoded them? Or do we recall memory in the way that we want to recall them? So those are some of the questions that we can raise about the science of memory formation and memory retrieval. Let's take a look at one case 
with difficulties in forming memory. So this is the case of HM. When HM was seven years old, he was hit by a cyclist and he suffered brain injury after that one. Soon after, um, this, the, the, this brain injury resulted to severe epileptic seizures. To stop these seizures, the doctor had to remove the hippocampus on both sides of HM's brain. So the seizures stopped, but at quite a cost, HM lost the ability to form new memories. Okay, so he lived forever in the present. So what does that mean? So in the case of HM, okay, he had difficulties forming memory after the removal of his hippocampus. Okay, he did not have a problem recalling what happened before the accident, but he had problems in recalling events that happened after the accident or after what I mean is the rem after the removal of his hippocampus. Okay, so let's take a look at the specifics of the case here. Brenda Miller, the neuropsychologist who examined HM regularly for more than 30 years, had to reintroduce herself every time that they meet. Okay, so most of his memories prior to the surgery remains intact. However, he had difficulties forming new memories after the surgery. Okay, so this is the first documented evidence of distinct kinds of memory in operation. So they, because of this incident, neurologists discovered that there are more than one type of memory okay, that we encode. And later on, we'll, we are going to look on those types of memories. Now, there are also other cases that are similar to the case of HM, where in, um, in one hospital, a nurse had to reintroduce himself or herself every time that they will interact with the patient. So there was some sort of experimental manipulation involved in that case. So what they did is that certain nurses have to act in, a, in an accommodating manner while some nurses have to be called towards the patient. So what they notice actually is that even though the client had to had no memory of the names of the nurses, even though the nurses had to reintroduce themselves every time that they would that they would interact with the client, the client felt better or had better interaction when he or she was interacting with the accommodating nurse compared to his interaction with the cold with the nurse who had cold treatment towards him or her. So in other words, even though these people had no recall of the identity of the nurses or the people that they are talking to, they have some sort of unconscious memory that helps them understand and determine how they should interact with these people. Okay, there may be instances wherein a person forgot that he he was that he had an accident in a certain place in the city, but they keep on avoiding that part of the city, although they cannot verbally explain what happened to them in that in that place. Okay, so later on, let's take a look at the types of memory for you to understand how do they differ with each other. Going back to the case of HM, so like what I told you, he had problems remembering new information such as the name of his neuropsychologist. So what they did was that they were trying to investigate his other types of memories if they're also affected by the removal of his hippocampus. And they noticed that when they made him do the star tracing task, like you can see on the left part of the screen, at first, in the, during the first day, he performed poorly, but as the days went by, he started to get better. Consciously, HM did not have any recall that he had performed the, the task in the previous days, but unconsciously, he is improving in his star tracing skills. So basically, this proves that we are not conscious about everything that we have learned. Okay, And there is what we call some sort of unconscious memory that affects how we understand events. 
Okay, this might even affect our habit formation. We may not be able to pinpoint at which point did we start did we start developing these habits, but eventually we are we just became conscious that we started doing these things. Okay? So that's it for the for the star tracing skills in the case of HM. So from this point, I can now introduce to you the different types of memory since the case of HM is one of the cases that illustrate that there are different types of memory instead of just one type of memory. Okay, so let's see those in the next few slides. The three-stage model of memory formation classifies memory into three, which are sensory, short-term, and long-term memory. So first, when we say short-term memory, this holds information in its original sensory form for a very brief period of time or half of a second. Say, for example, you have seen a lightning from a distance or you have seen a person said hi to you so that immediately enters your short term memory your sensory memory i mean then from sensory memory it gets transformed into what we call short term memory or the temporary or the temporary storage of limited amount of information before it is either transferred to long term storage or forgotten okay so we can say that the stimuli or event is now in the short-term memory if we can recall it between 2 to 30 seconds then eventually from short-term memory we consolidate we store and now it is in the long-term memory so a long-term memory has the capacity to store vast amount of information for as little as 30 seconds and as long as a lifetime Okay, so here is an example of the existence of sensory memory. We may smell, taste, feel, see, or hear an experience. Okay, so according to literature, there are two types of sensory memory. The first is iconic memory, which is a brief memory of visual stimulus, while echoic memory is the sh short-term retention of sounds. Okay, so there, this is typically use an experiment the one that you can see on the right this design we're in these seconds are flashed in a very short amount of time just half a second or one second then you will be asked to recall what you have seen in the previous screen so one discovery is that if if some of these pound symbols or number symbols are presented after these numbers are presented they actually hinder or they act as a distraction in memory formation. In other words, it is easier for the participants to recall the numbers if they see a blank screen rather than seeing four number symbols after the numbers. Okay, now after the sensory memory, it is now being transformed into a short-term memory, but some would call it working memory. Some would argue that they are not the same, while some literature would say that working memory is the concept that replaces short-term memory. So the working memory is the part of memory required to attend to or solve a problem at hand. Okay, so some would say that these are the differences between working and short-term memory. So working memory utilizes the information in the short-term memory so in other words in short-term memory yes you remember something short-term but you're not really utilizing it or you are not manipulating the memory while remembering it okay also compared to short-term memory working memory is the one associated with intellectual capacity so they associate greater working memory with greater intellectual capability i will have an example for you in the next slide okay so here's an example okay so typically this is the format or type of question used in an intelligence test that assesses the memory of an individual look at this so here's the instruction i will tell you a set of numbers of letters and numbers you need to tell me the numbers first before the letters in order okay to be specific now here's an example item so i will tell you these 
um, this pattern A25 FH7. Okay, but you cannot answer A25 FH7 because the instruction says that you need to say the numbers first before the letter. So while you are remembering that in your short term memory, you're also using your working memory to manipulate the order of the letters and numbers. Hence, you can come up with the correct answer such as 257 AFH. This is a typical item used in what we call a time individual intelligence test okay and when we get to intelligence testing i will show you different ways of how do we assess intelligence in the intelligence tests that are widely used in psychology okay short-term memory capacity of most people is between five and nine units of letters digits or chunks of information so typically they say that the working memory or short-term memory can hold up to seven information at a time okay so that's why sometimes we use strategies to make it easier to remember this information such as chunking or breaking down a list of items to be remembered into a smaller set of meaningful units that's why when you say the number of a, mob a mobile number, you do not say everything rapidly, but rather you try to group them together by saying the first four numbers first, followed by the next three and the last four. Okay, so that's one example of chunking. Here is one illustration by Badili of one possible explanation or visualization of how does the working memory works. Okay, so basically what he's saying is that in working memory, there are different parts of the brain involved. And like what we have been mentioning since we were studying consciousness, first, we need to be able to pay attention to the right information that we want to encode. Okay, so that we can learn more about the, about the event. And that's basically the role of the central executive. Since you are bombarded by different sensations and perception, the central executive decide which among these different information happening around you is the most relevant. Okay, that's why there are some there are some instances wherein we tend to ignore less important things and we pay more attention to events. Okay, that require our immediate attention. Okay, and when the central executive decides which information is it going to pay attention to, there are three temporary storages in the brain. Okay, that stores this information before they get into the long term memory. Okay, and later we will go on to the parts of the brain involved in memory formation and retrieval. So what are the three brain regions or temporary storages that were proposed in Badley's model of working memory? First, there is what we call visual spatial sketch pad or there's a part of the brain involved in temporarily remembering information that are visual and spatial. Say for example, you, you know that you are in, in a certain place because you know how you were able to navigate to that location. What turns did you take? What are you going to do to get to your next location? Are you on the left side or are you on the right side of the road? Okay, so that's the visual spatial sketchpad. We also have a temporary storage for, for auditory memory and that is the phonological loop. And we also have a temporary storage for events all in all, which is called the episodic buffer before they get encoded into the long term memory. So it's called a buffer because just like a computer, when you type something in Microsoft Word and your computer was lagging, it doesn't necessarily show what you have typed in the keyboard, but rather it goes first to the central processing unit or to the CPU before it shows in your screen. So basically that's how episodic buffer works. Okay, and in order for this information to be transported from temporary storage to 
long-term memory, it needs to undergo rehearsal or repeatedly practicing the material so that it enters the long-term memory. Okay, that's why sometimes you have to study a certain material more than once in order for you to store that information into long-term memory. Here are some other phenomena that may influence what you recall. So first, we have here what we call primacy effect, also known as first impressions in other, in other literature. So basically, if I tell you 20 words, you have the capability of recalling the items that appeared in the beginning of the list. And we also have recency effect or the tendency to recall okay, things that are in the end of the list. Okay, so basically, if you're trying to make a person remember something, he or she has the capability to remember what happened in the beginning and what happened at the end. That's why they say that when you're trying to make an essay, put the most important ideas in the beginning and end at the end to make a point. Okay, primacy effect and recency effect may also influence how we evaluate people. Say, for example, in performance evaluation in industrial psychology, managers may be plagued by primacy effect. In other words, they can rate a certain employee highly on different dimensions because of first impression. So we have the tendency to think that people are excellently doing even though they are not because our first impression of them is that they are excellent. On the other hand, there's also what we call recency effect, okay, wherein a person is actually doing good, but because of a recent mistake, we give a failing mark to that person. Okay, so that's why it's important for managers to keep a detailed record of the different events that occurred in the company so that when the time of evaluation arrives, he will not rely on primacy and recency effects, but rather he has a detailed list of key behaviors that needed to be evaluated. Okay, so that's one way to counteract the effects of primacy and recency effects. Now let's move on to long-term memory. So just like the other types of memory that has subdivisions, long-term memory has a lot of different subtypes of memory under, under the concept of long-term memory. So first, we have what we call implicit, also known as non-declarative memory. Sometimes it's called unconscious memory. So this is a kind of memory made up of knowledge based on previous experience such as skills that we perform automatically once we have mastered them. Okay, so under that implicit memory, we have specifically what we call procedural memory or a kind of memory made up of implicit knowledge for almost any behavior or physical skill that we have learned. So examples of implicit or non-declarative memory can be like what I told you about the experiment in the hospital wherein the person does not have a conscious recall of the different names of the nurses, but he knows who among them is kind and who among them is cold, uh, who among them gives him a cold treatment. Okay, so we do not consciously pay attention to the kindness of the person, but we know implicitly that this person is accommodating or agreeable. That's one kind of implicit memory. You cannot verbalize or explain that you know he's kind. You just know deep inside that he or she is kind. Okay, so in procedural memory, I can give you one example. As an adult, I know how to ride the bike, but I do not know consciously when did that behavior start or when did I first learn how to ride a bike. It's just that my memory or the skill of riding the bike is already there, but I cannot point out exactly how did I develop the skill of riding a bike. So that's one example of procedural memory. Most of the time when we are doing step-by-step -step, um, procedures, we are not consciously recalling how we have done it before, but we just know that this is the procedure of how to swim, how to walk, how to run, and that falls under implicit memory. So you do not have to consciously think how to walk when you are wo when you are walking because you already know how to walk. Okay, it's more of a habit than something that you consciously recall. 
So on the other side of the equation, we have what we call explicit or declarative memory, which is composed of recall of facts and events. So the key word for this one is that it is conscious. Okay, and like the other one, which is more unconscious. So one example of declarative memory can be semantic or the facts or general knowledge or what you learned in school. Like what's the surname of Elvis? You can say Presley. Okay, the name of the first president of the Philippines. So the, what's the name of the current president? So that can be the semantic memory or the facts and general knowledge. On the other hand, we also have episodic memory or the memory that recalls the experiences that we've had. See, for example, you can verbalize what happened during your 15th birthday. Okay, who attended? What happened? What were the events that occurred during your birthday? So you can tell a story about it. Okay, and the way that you tell a story about yourself, basically, that really helps in identity formation in what Mac Adams and Pulse called the narrative identity. So if you want more reading about the narrative identity, I suggest that you search more about Mac Adams and Paul's narrative, um, personal narratives and life story. Now let's talk about the brain regions most involved with memory. So sensory memories are processed and coded in various sensory cortexes. So I hope that you remember the sensory cortex that we talk about in sensation and perception, particularly when there are changes in the body, such as in your skin, in your muscles, etc. And next, let's talk about short-term memory. So in short-term memory, um, it is processed in the hippocampus and in the frontal lobe. So this is now where we can see the role of the hippocampus. And the long-term memories are stored in the different parts of the cortex and subcortex. So in other words, the long-term memories that we have are not really stored in the hippocampus, but rather they are permanently stored in the different cortexes that we have. And the hippocampus basically helps in the retrieval and the storage of this information. So the hippocampus is like the manager that connects the different memories that we have and gets the necessary information when we need it. And sometimes in retrieval, the areas associated with the prefrontal cortex help as well. Okay, so let's talk about the short term or the psychobiology of the short term memory. So the prefrontal cortex determines what information in the environment is worthy of our attention. Just like what I told you when we talk about the Baddeley's model of working memory. It will make its way to the prefrontal cortex, from the prefrontal cortex to the hippocampus because the hippocampus is where the memory is being consolidated. So memory consolidation in the hippocampus may take hours or days and sometimes weeks before memory is transferred back to the cortex for permanent storage. Okay, So it doesn't permanently stay in the hippocampus, but rather that is just where it is being consolidated and it's transferred back to the cortex for a more permanent storage of memory. Now let's pinpoint the actual areas that Badali was talking about in his visualization of the working memory that I presented to you earlier. So first, I hope you remember that he gave importance to the role of attention and focus. Okay, and that is basically the role of the prefrontal cortex. So it determines which kind of information coming from the environment that you should attend to. Okay, so should you attend to the sound of the fan or should you attend to the snake in front of you? So that's the role of the prefrontal cortex. And next, so where, what are the locations involved in the phonological loop in the visual spatial sketch pad? So in the phonological loop, like what I said in our previous discussions, it has a lot to do with, um, with understanding sound. And what I told you in our previous lectures is that when it comes to comprehension, or understanding, or encoding auditory information that has a lot to do with the Wernicke's area, which is the area responsible for comprehension, 
this is here. Okay, in our image here on the right. And in Visual Spatial Sketchpad, actually it's split into two. It, the temporal lobe is responsible for spatial information. So here's the temporal lobe. You can see where it's pointing to. Okay, so it's in charge of spatial information, part particularly identifying where you are in a certain place. Okay, or this is helpful in pointing out directions, navigating your way. Okay, so we learned in this discussion that the temporal lobe is not only important when it comes to comprehending sounds and auditory information, it's also important in spatial information. That's why sometimes it helps us to identify if something is near or far based on the sound. So does it sound that, that is the sound coming from somewhere near or is it far? And the occipital lobe is responsible, as you know it, as a temporary storage for visual information. Okay, so when we are learning to do things or what we call implicit procedures, the output of of that encoding would be most likely to be stored in the cerebellum. That's why the cerebellum plays a huge role in body coordination, such as the one what you do when you are biking or when you are doing tasks that requires coordination, exercising, doing push-ups, etc. And in the striatum. The striatum is important in goal directed or spontaneous activities. Okay, and other than that, so when an, when an experience is an emotional one, it is being stored in the amygdala. Okay, and like what I told you earlier, if, if a certain memory is an emotional memory, so the amygdala actually works hand in hand with the hippocampus in recalling that memory. Okay, so now amygdala is, somehow, um, is involved in the development of what we call anxiety disorders such as phobia so these people may have an overactive amygdala okay next let's go to the third bullet here so if implicit information goes to the cerebellum in the striatum explicit information say for example personal events who attended the meeting okay for example facts information about the country about history about what you're trying to study it goes mostly to the hippocampus okay and then after being processed by the hippocampus it doesn't stay there for a long time but rather it is being stored back in the cortex or so particularly in the cortical association areas from where it came so basically when there's new information it goes to the area responsible for it okay like the phonological loop or the visual spatial sketch pad and then it is being consolidated in the in the hippocampus and then stored permanently from the area where it came from okay that may be the temporal lobe or the occipital lobe or what or other parts of the brain involved in memory formation so here are different er the different areas of the brain responsible in memory formation. So when you're dealing with implicit, particularly procedural memory, the parts of the brain involved in that would be the cerebellum and the striatum. Okay, and for emotional memory, that should be the amygdala. And for hippocampus, that would be the interaction between the cortical association areas and the hippocampus. And the role of the hippocampus will be primarily on making us, helping us remember explicit or declarative memory. Okay, so specifically, this is these are the brain areas that are responsible. So if something is implicit or unconscious, here are the brain areas involved. So we can still see the amygdala there, but particularly there would be the cerebellum and the striatum. Okay, so research in abnormal psychology would actually point out the role of striatum and cerebellum in habitual behaviors, such as those demonstrated by people with, let's say, for example, um, obsessive compulsive disorders, the repetitive hand washing, repetitive cleaning, okay, etc. So it becomes a habit. Now, Look at these. Um, look at the left side here for explicit memory. So here are the brain areas involved: the motor cortex, matter sensory cortex, the auditory cortex, okay, prefrontal cortex, the 
the and then the occipital lobe for the visual memory and then they are being processed in the hippocampus before they are stored permanently in the cortex where they came from so now let's take a look at the malleability of memory so during that time there is a great importance being given to eyewitness testimony because it's hard to gather evidences from other sources because of the technological limitations during that time so jennifer did his best did her best to carefully and meticulously study the face of her rapist so the actual rapist bobby pool was never in the photo lineup or in the live lineup remember in the series that you watch the person gets to choose who among those people who in the lineup is the is the criminal okay who performed who was the one involved in the crime okay but someone who looked incredibly similar to Poole, namely ronald cotton okay was he was convicted even though he wasn't really the one who raped jennifer thompson so because of this evidence cotton was granted a second trial okay but at the second trial, when Jennifer both saw both Poole and Cotton together in the same courtroom, she still identified Cotton as her rapist. So Poole gets to walk freely, um, gets to walk free once again. But, and once again, they convicted the wrong person. Eventually, Cotton gained his freedom, but only after DNA testing was introduced. So in other words, they put the wrong man in jail due to the wrong um, due to the inaccurate witness testimony of Jennifer Thompson. Um, if I remember it correctly, um, Cotton and Thompson became good friends after that one, and then they released a book about this experience. Okay, so maybe this information will change how much we rely on the information coming from other people because our our memory about certain events may be may be plagued by certain distractors such as emotion or we may pay atten we may have paid attention to the wrong details or sometimes we have a problem with the recall of the memory itself that's why what we recall may not be the same with what really happened okay so now let's take a look at the malleability of memory so first let's take a look at false memories so false memories or these are memories for events that never happened but were suggested by someone or something so there are instances wherein we feel as if something happened something that's happening in the present has happened before but in reality such memory does not exist so one possible explanation why false memories exist is that because it's because of suggestion or hypnotic suggestions say for example in the case of those with with dissociative identity disorder most of people most of the people with the idea are highly hypnotizable okay and there's a theory saying that dad may be a product of hypnosis okay so you will learn more about that when you get to abnormal psychology but i'm giving you an introductory idea about it it's saying that DAD can be worsened if the clinician uses hypnosis or if the clinician is not conscious about his or her methods, he may actually worsen the DAD of the person because people with DAD are highly hypnotizable. And because of hypnosis, you may create false memories and in some instances, false personalities or false alters. Okay, that's just one of the possible explanations next let's talk about recovered memory so a memory may from a real event that was encoded stored but not retrieved for a long time until some time later brings it suddenly into consciousness so there are instances wherein there are memories that we don't easily remember okay but because of a specific cue from the environment we suddenly recall that memory and most of these types of memories happen because of abuse or trauma okay when we say trauma i'm referring to the definition of the diagnostic and statistical manual for mental disorder okay that you can only experience trauma if you've had um what's this near death experience um physical injury or sexual violation other than that it's not considered trauma 
Okay? So, those people who experience abuse, they do experience trauma because there's physical injury in physical abuse. Okay? And most of the time, accounts of people who have experienced trauma would say that they don't remember some aspects of their childhood and that's one example of repression. So, that's a Freudian explanation about why do people with trauma forget their childhood? It's because these experiences are are not so desirable. So what they do is that they repress them into the unconscious. Okay, but because of some experience in the present, say for example, they met their abuser once again, they were able to recall that that person abused them, and it helped them be it, it helped them recall the experience. And it helped them talk about the experience. Other than that, there's also what we call misinformation effect, wherein we are being disguided with wrong or misleading information because the person knows that memory is malleable. Say, for example, criminals may try to get away with what they have done by through mis misinformation effects. Say, for example, they might plant the idea that the perpetrator is a male, but in reality, it was a female. Okay, so it shows to us that sometimes we tend to overestimate our ability to remember certain aspects of a situation. And, and being able to remember a certain situation is also a type of intelligence, and we're going to talk about this when we get to intelligence. What I'm saying is that there are people who are more capable of remembering some things, but there are also some types of people who are not so good with remembering or with memory, okay? Now, since we are talking about memory loss, let's talk about amnesia. So, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM-5, um, dissociative amnesia is, an ability to rec is the inability to recall important autobiographical information that should be successfully stored in memory and ordinarily would be readily remembered. So what differentiates amnesia from forgetfulness is that in forgetfulness, forgetfulness may actually be normal. See, for example, if you don't pay attention to the lesson, then you're going to forget what I'm teaching. Okay, that's normal forgetfulness. Okay, and there are factors that, that predict forgetfulness. See, for example, age. Okay, and the lack of awareness. But in amnesia, this is not ordinary forgetfulness because it's not normal for you to forget your name, your family, your address. Because these things are successfully stored in memory and they are easily available. They are readily remembered. However, you are not able to remember them and that's what defines amnesia. How do we differentiate amnesia from dementia or from what we call neurocognitive disorder? A neurocognitive disorder does not uh, does not um, disrupt memory abruptly okay it progresses as time goes by and this neurocognitive disorder and the symptoms are easily um, can be easily observed as time goes by but with um, but with amnesia the sons the onset is acute or it or what I mean to say by acute is that it is sudden okay and typical typical Causes of amnesia may include trauma once again, physical or psychological. Say, for example, physical trauma may be an accident. Or amnesia may also be caused by psychological stimulus. Say, for example, um, psychological abuse. Okay, that can also cause amnesia. Okay, so now let's talk about the various types of amnesia. First, we have here what we call localized amnesia. So when we say localized amnesia, there is a failure to recall events during a circumscribed period of time. When we say localized amnesia, you forget everything about a specific event. See, for example, you forgot everything about your 10th birthday. Although you did your best to remember what happened during your 10th birthday, you forgot what happened during that time. And that is the most common form of, of amnesia. And the most, one of the most widely used examples of localized amnesia happens during a crime. Say, for example, forgetting the appearance of the person who was the perpetrator in sexual abuse, forgetting the name of the rapist, forgetting the, 
the appearance of the of the thief okay that's an example of localized amnesia why did you forget these events it's because of the psychological trauma brought to us by events again going back to freud's explanation so if something is traumatic then we tend to forget it we do our best unconsciously to forget these experiences we deny these experiences okay and here's another type of amnesia selective amnesia okay it's all actually similar to localized but the difference is this in localized you forgot everything but in selective amnesia there are some certain information that you remember say for example you forgot the name of the one who stole your purse the one who stole your bag but you can still remember that he has brown eyes okay that is selective amnesia what makes it selective is that you were able to remember something you did not forget everything okay next is that generalized amnesia okay if localized amnesia is common general generalized amnesia is rare when we say that you have generalized amnesia you forgot everything okay and you have it's like erasing everything that it's that's in your mind complete loss of memory okay and it's very rare we also have what we call systematic or systematized amnesia loses memory per specific category of information say for example after the trauma you forgot everything about relationship okay it's not the same with localized because when we say localized it's about one event one period of time but when we say systematized it does not necessarily mean that all of those events happen in one time but rather it's about a single topic or a single category of information for example everything about school everything about family everything about work okay next we do have what we call continuous amnesia and when we say continuous it's hard for them to create new memories after the trauma okay just like what we talk about in the earlier case continuous amnesia typically happens because of brain injury okay your parts of the brain in charge of forming memory has been damaged that's why it's hard for you to create new memories so basically those are the different types of amnesia according to dsm-5 and when you get to abs abnormal psychology you will learn more about amnesia okay and you will also learn more about related disorders such as dissociative identity disorder and speak about speak of did let's talk about one of the symptoms of did one of the symptoms of did is dissociative view okay dissociative view is also found in dissociative amnesia it's a, actually a subtype of dissociative amnesia so what is few it, it 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 its meaning is flight or travel thus the word fugitive okay and when we say that you experience dissociative view these are unexpected trips unexpected travels okay say for example individuals just take off and later find themselves in a new place unable to remember why and how they got there okay look at the cases of the people with dissociative identity disorder they will be surprised that why am i in the restroom why am i in the room why am i at school why am i in the park i did not even remember going to this place okay and we can say that you have experienced dissociative view if the person cannot recall anything about what happened and he just found himself in a random place okay so eventually the few will end and you will be conscious but you will not remember how you got there what you will remember is the last thing that you were doing before the few that's why people may say that why am i in the bank the last thing i remember is that i was at school okay and that's one of the symptoms of dissociative that's one of the subtypes of dissociative amnesia but it's more commonly observed among people with dissociative identity disorder so i hope you did learn a lot from this lecture about amnesia how do we form about amnesia in memory how do we form memory and what are the factors affecting memory formation and individual differences in memory as well and i hope that you were able to get more information about the various types of amnesia and what are the differences among people who experience such such um, disorder or such emotional problem so basically that is it for our discussion for today and thank you for listening